Hello everybody, today I continue my journey exploring the back catalogue of MG and Rover products from the late 90s and early noughties. In this instalment I drive what could be one of the most interesting yet least appreciated of the whole lot. This is the MG ZT T190. <laughs> If you're on the search for a used car, a car vertical report is an essential tool in the fight against dodgy motors and dodgier sellers. Cross-referencing a number of databases from across the globe, car vertical tells you what others might wish to hide. Now available on both desktop and as a handy mobile app, a car vertical report can be produced quickly and easily with just a reg number or a VIN. For a special discount on the service, just use my link and discount code in the comment or the description down below. Just in case you aren't familiar or have forgotten how the Rover and MG model lineup worked at the time, let me remind you. So, you had as the entry point the Rover 25 hatchback, above that the 45 saloon, that they also did a hatch version, but let's call it a saloon. Then you had the retro styled and range topping Rover 75, the largest and also newest of the lot. That car was developed with money and support from Rover's then owners, BMW. Alongside these cars, you also had the quirky and somewhat loved MGF sports car. Around the turn of the millennium, BMW and Rover parted ways, with the company being taken over by a group known as the Phoenix Consortium. The full story of what happened next is one so interesting it's certainly worth its own video. However, what's relevant for today is that one of the things the Phoenix Consortium did was reintroduce the MG brand. At that point, all the company was selling was the MGF Roadster. So, a very smart plan was hatched to turn the existing Rover lineup of 25, 45 and 75 into sportier variants under the MG badge. The 25 turned into the ZR, the 45 turned into the ZS, and the 75 turned into the ZT. The ZT, as it happens, I think is the most interesting of the lot, but probably also the least fondly remembered. The ZR was a car much loved by hooligans of the time, including some of my friends. The ZS is a car derided at the time, but now loved for its Honda underpinnings. It was also notable in period for offering a V6 engine at a price point where many others would just give you a four. Those were both cars that I think very naturally suited the sporty direction that MG wanted to go. However, the 75 was aimed at your older, more sophisticated customer. It was essentially a cut price alternative to a Jaguar. And according to all who drove it when new, it was actually a very good car. So then, what happened to turn the 75 into the spicier MG ZT? They took essentially the badge engineering playbook and did the lot. So, at the front and rear, you have moderately different bumpers. Naturally, the suspension was also reworked, is firmer and lower. The springs allegedly 70% stiffer, the anti-roll bars thicker. There were also different wheels, better brakes, and the powertrain options were also tailored towards the sportier customer. This car is the 190. Up front, you'll find a two and a half litre version of the Rover KV6, as you'll have seen in the MG ZS 180. To get that extra 10 horsepower, this car has a different intake, different camshafts, and also a revised throttle too. Torque was 181 pound foot, so up by about four over the ZS 180. That's 245 newton meters. And even more confusingly, you had two transmission options, this five-speed manual or an automatic. But if you bought that, you actually got a 180 horsepower version of the engine that isn't the same as the ZS 180. Instead, it's the 190 engine also detuned. There was a 160 horsepower version of the engine too, though I have to say that must be reasonably rare because I don't think I've ever seen one. The range was eventually padded out at the bottom end by the introduction of a 1.8 litre K-series four-cylinder making 120 horsepower. This was then joined by a 160 horsepower turbocharged 1.8 K-series which replaced the lower powered V6. There were also a couple of diesel options, though neither were particularly spicy. One was badged as 120 PS, the other 135. What is notable there though is that unlike the rest of the MG Rover lineup, that diesel was in fact a BMW unit and is generally quite well regarded. If you're looking for a motorway mile muncher, it's an excellent choice. But the engine I think most people actually remember is neither Rover nor BMW. 
it's a Ford because later on in its life they managed to stick the 4.6 litre Ford modular V8 in the front of this and turn it to rear wheel drive. Allegedly this wasn't anywhere near as much work as you might imagine because early on the car was actually designed to be a rear wheel drive platform but for whatever reason, potentially BMW's interference, most of the cars were front wheel drive like this. Sadly, even that version of the car wasn't particularly potent, with the Ford Lump managing just 260 horsepower, but a slightly healthier 302 pound-foot of torque. The V8 became an instant cult classic the moment it was released. However, for the rest of the lineup, things were not so good. With the collapse of MG Rover in 2005, even when they were relatively new products, very few people actually wanted to buy them. And that is a real shame, because as I found out this year, nearly all of the products in the MG Rover catalogue have something going for them, from the MGTF, which today is an interesting alternative to a third gen MR2, to the Rover 25 that I drove, which I have to say I rather love, and is still a piece of bargain motoring. The MG ZS I also recently drove and fell in love with all over again. And coming to this is really no different because there are so many things to like about this car. Where do I start? Well, it's not the best looking thing, I will admit. It has dated somewhat and these were always cars intended to be a little bit retro styled. I would say the MG variant has aged a little bit better than the Rover. Very late in their life, as with the rest of the range, they did get a facelift which divides opinion greatly. I am a big fan of the colour, it's apparently Le Mans green, they did a similar Goodwood green which I think is a touch darker. But the thing about this particular example which is really surprising me is how well the interior has stood the test of time. This is, I'm told, a reasonably well optioned car, though in all honesty I couldn't tell you what those options are. It has a sunroof, which works, parking sensors, which work, this car does not have the sat nav that some of these and the 75s do, and truth be told, that really is the only giveaway I think you'd find of these cars BMW parentage. I am honestly amazed at just how bespoke this interior feels. In fact, I'm not even sure how much from the rest of the Rover catalogue they've used. Everything feels like it's in pretty good working order. Even the gearbox, which in some cars can be sloppy and horrible, is actually really quite nice, feels very tight. One of the things about the 75 and ZT which always amused me, you know how some cars you remember them for things that really were quite inconsequential but you still remember them for that? Well with these, it's the obsession with ovals. In modern day Audis and Lamborghinis, the designers have gone all mad for hexagons. Everything is a hexagon, I'm amazed the wheel isn't. But here, it was ovals. All of the clocks, ovals, the vents, ovals, the buttons here, ovals. They went mad for ovals. There are a few small creaks and things in here, but honestly, none that would annoy me, and I'm quite sensitive to that sort of stuff. It is also a very relaxing thing to drive, and the suspension I must give special mention to. Despite the fact it is considerably firmer than the 75, it's really well judged. I would say in terms of the balance between comfort and sporty, it sits right in the middle and does a brilliant job. Though the steering isn't the most feelsome, it's actually quite keen to turn in, more so than you would expect. You can certainly feel what the road surface is doing, but you're also quite isolated from it. Manhole covers and the like don't send a shudder through the cabin. It's all very grown up. Sure, the interior does in places feel somewhat cheap. This material here I've never really liked, though in this car it hasn't tried to escape, which in many others it does. There's air conditioning, the sunroof, power steering, electric windows all round. You've even got heated seats. Okay, they are manually adjustable, but I have no problem with them. And in actual fact, I quite like them. They're very supportive, but also comfortable. And that really seems to be the theme throughout this whole car. Everything is really, really nicely judged. It isn't particularly quick, it's just not. Put your foot down and though it responds quite well, it's still 190 horsepower, not a lot of torque, dragging a one and a half ton plus car. I did check that weight figure a couple of times, allegedly about 1500 kilos this thing, which seems quite light actually. This car also comes from that fantastic era where it isn't the biggest of machines, but does have quite a bit of space inside. You can seat four adults in here fairly comfortably, though rear seat space isn't quite as generous as it might be in, say, a 5 Series. Boot space, though, is excellent, and here you have a nice low load lip, meaning you can get a lot of stuff in there very easily. 
Sadly, as with many other MG Rover products, their greatest strength is also their greatest weakness. They're cheap. They've nearly always been cheap, even when they were only a couple of years old. They were a bargain, especially once MG Rover had collapsed, because nobody wanted a car that no longer had a warranty on it. Even today, ignoring the V8s, for these you're going to pay between one to two thousand pounds, a little bit less for a really tatty one and a little bit more for a fairly nice one. That's not a lot, but you need to be aware that certainly if you're buying at the cheaper end of the market, you are going to spend quite a bit making it a good one. Common issues affecting the ZT include rust and they suffer in different places depending on the body style. Apparently the estate is actually a little bit better for water ingress than the saloon. Though the engine itself is actually fairly durable and has a decent reputation, certainly better than the four-cylinder K-series, it is quite prone to leaks in various places. The variable intake manifold is also well known for failing in both these and the ZS. Repairing that is a few hundred pound job. I can't say for sure with these, but in the ZS, the KV6 cam belt change is a pig of a job that can easily set you back about 600 pounds, so many people avoid it, leave it far too long, and then eventually it fails, which will do damage to the engine. Being cars often run on a shoestring, you'll also find many of them with cheap tyres, brakes, worn out suspension components, so on and so forth. Truth is, if you just get the car into good condition, it really is a very fine thing. As evidenced by this, I absolutely love it. Visibility is good, that gearbox, nice throw, very solid action, pleasing to use. The engine is smooth, creamy, has a very distinctive note about it. I would strongly recommend against putting an aftermarket exhaust on an estate car in particular, because if it is even a little bit boomy, you're really going to suffer. Fuel economy is fairly good. It can be about as high as 30. Generally speaking, I'd say you're gonna average somewhere in the 20s. At the upper end, if you're sensible, at the lower end, if you're not. And it is a car you can have some fun in. Some slightly grumbly brakes aside, this thing is brilliant. No, it isn't particularly fast, but it's got enough poke in it that when you've got the road to yourself, you can have fun. I enjoy the noise. The steering is good, not quite as good as in the ZS, but still turns in well and gives you a lot more feel and feedback than you may be used to in something modern. Grip level is impressive. Stability is much better than I would have expected. You can carry decent speed through the corners. It also works with the road really well. And I gotta say, if you're on the hunt for a petrol head friendly, somewhat interesting, these days quite rare, but still very usable and practical car at a low price, you could do a lot worse than one of these. But do buy in the knowledge that whatever you get, unless it's got a lot of recent history, is likely to need at least a grand thrown at it straight away. Do that, and then what you'll be left with is actually a rather charming, very enjoyable, and quite practical slice of old British motoring. This does not feel at all like something lashed together at the last minute on a shoestring. I'd have one. I really want a ZS, but actually, as a sensible, dailyable car, this is a much better option. It just is. Anyway, a huge thank you to Peter for bringing his car out. If you happen to have an example of something else from the MG Rover catalogue, be it 90s, noughties, earlier, or perhaps even something more modern that I haven't driven and you'd like to see on the channel, please drop me a line. My email address is in the description of every single video, especially if you happen to have an MG X-Power SVR. That's something I'd really like to get my claws into, but I appreciate that's going to take a while to find. In any case, a huge thanks to you for watching. Don't forget to hit the like button, comment down below, subscribe, if you haven't already and I'll see you for the next one. Bye bye.